The Epistle of John and the Book of Hebrews are the only writings among the apostolic canon that do not identify the author. However, since the second century, other leaders of the early church almost exclusively accept the Apostle John as the author. Ignatius quotes from 1 John, attributing the epistle to the last living apostle and eyewitness to the life and ministry of Messiah Yeshua. John made his headquarters in the city of Ephesus and wrote this epistle at the time of great division and apostasy among the late first century believers. At the end of the first century, John's world was one of great religious and philosophical syncretism. The Greco-Roman society of the late first century was not unlike today, where we see a concerted effort to force religious tolerance and acceptance of all belief systems into one cohesive, socially acceptable religious system. The concept of Chrislam and the t-shirts and bumper stickers that spell out coexist in the symbols of many religions and philosophies would be right at home in John's day as they are today. The Apostle John had an important message for the believers in the Church of Asia Minor in that day. If we understand the context of his time and the world religious and philosophical system in which he writes this important epistle, we will find his words resonate just as loudly today as they did then. I'm Dan Cathcart and this is The Apostle's Journey. The city of Ephesus was not only one of the most prominent and important seaports in the ancient world, but was an important cultural and religious center as well. Ephesus boasted the Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This city on the Aegean Sea played an important part in the Apostle Paul's life and ministry. In the very heart of spiritual darkness, Ephesus provided Paul a stable place where he lived and worked for more than three years. Now some three decades later, Ephesus is again the home of a great man of God and apostle of Messiah Yeshua. At the time of John's first epistle, the body of believers was in a great struggle. The Gentiles brought many of their pagan philosophies and religious practices with them into the body of believers. In many cases, the local assemblies had been taken over by the Gentiles, rejecting the Jewish believers altogether. In other cases, entirely new assemblies were formed by and for the Gentiles. Look at 3 John 1 verse 9, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Some 30 years earlier, the Jewish believers in Jerusalem were banished from the temple and cut off from their people by order of the Sanhedrin. They had fled the city just as the various Jewish religious and political factions descended into all-out civil war, and the city became a very dangerous place. Now in John's day, many of the Jewish brethren were rejected by their Gentile counterparts as well. If the book of 1 John can be described in a few words, perhaps it can be viewed as a book of contrasts and clear choices. In his world, John witnessed the rise of what would become known as Gnosticism, a philosophy and lifestyle of moral and ethical relativism. John's epistle boils it all down to absolute choices. John opens his epistle with the most important absolute, 1 John 1, 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen, and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. False teachers were an existential threat to the body of believers in John's day as they are to us today. 
John doesn't mess around with opening pleasantries and greetings. He hits it direct and hard right from the get-go. John opens with a list of certainties about the person and the work of Yeshua. With the philosophy of Gnosticism beginning to creep into the body, with its denial of both the deity and the humanity of Yeshua, John opens by reiterating the true nature of Messiah Yeshua. The Apostle Paul also wrote to the Galatians about those who propagate a false gospel. Go to Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. John was an eyewitness to the word of life and experienced a direct revelation with his senses. He stated that he personally had heard with his ears, seen with his eyes, and touched with his hands concerning the word of life. For John, the word of life was manifested in Yeshua of Nazareth. The word manifested is from the Greek word phaneroo, number 5319, in the Strong's Concordance, meaning to make or render apparent, to make visible what was hidden. John had the privilege of witnessing the life and presence of Yeshua, the Son of God, on this earth, and then takes the responsibility to reveal and preserve the gospel in the fallen world around him. John proclaims and reveals the word of life so that the believers may have fellowship with God the Father and His Son Yeshua. Fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, number 2842, meaning a partnership, social intercourse, or communion. It implies a participation in a common cause or shared life. And in this way, their joy is made complete. John next identifies or defines the basis of our fellowship with Yeshua by contrasting light and darkness. 1 John 1, 5 through 10. This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Because God is light, as John puts it, to have fellowship with him, we cannot remain in darkness. We cannot abide in the false doctrines that are creeping into the body of believers. John may be addressing the leaders of the assemblies in Asia Minor when he writes these words. It is the duty of the pastors and spiritual leaders to warn their flocks about false teachers and the doctrines they spread. If we say we have fellowship with God and Yeshua and embrace and follow false teachers and their doctrines, then we are liars. John says those walking in sin and then denying it say that they are, are not, have not sinned make Yeshua to be a liar and Yeshua's words are not in them. This is a direct reference to the Gnostic concepts of moral relativism which was taking root in the congregations John is writing to. But John says that even if one has strayed away from the light and fallen for the darkness, repentance is possible. Look at 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation of our sins and not of ours only, but also for the whole world. John moves on to another topic, 
How does one identify those who belong to God and are walking in the light? Again, John presents a striking and observable contrast between a true believer and follower of Messiah and one who has fallen for a false gospel. 1 John 2, 3-6 Now, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. It is very simple to determine who the followers and true believers are. A true believer and follower of Yeshua will be one who keeps his commandments. If he does not keep his commandments, then he is a liar, plain and simple. In the next few verses, John says that this is not a new concept, that they have known or should have known this from the very beginning. 1 John 2, 7-8 through 8. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Now, is there a confusion here between verses 7 and 8? In verse 7, John states he writes no new commandment, but in verse 8, he writes a new commandment I write to you. In our previous teachings from the book of Hebrews, we learned about the world to come. We learned that this world is in the ongoing process of coming into being. John is writing the same message to his readers. The process is continuing and is not yet complete. The light of Messiah is present and shining in the world, but darkness is still present as well. John is admonishing his readers to follow the light and shun the darkness while they still can. John next explains just how to do it. 1 John 2, 9-11 He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. As we come to the last section of chapter 2, John again uses a present active tense to describe the danger of the things of this world. John writes of the things of this world as passing away. 1 John 2, 15-17 Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. John's warning is not about the physical creation which God called good and, or the people in it, but about the invisible spiritual system of evil in the world, that which is governed by Satan. John is saying that the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God cannot coexist. They are mutually exclusive. Now, if it is true that a true believer is not characterized by a love of the world as defined by John, then it is also true that those in the world cannot demonstrate genuine love for the gospel, for Yeshua, or their fellow man. I'm certain that talk among the believers throughout the diaspora about the imminent return of Yeshua had been at a fever pitch since the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the rampant persecution of the believers under various Roman emperors. Now, John reminds his readers of the spirit of rebellion against the things of God that he called the spirit of Antichrist. John writes of many Antichrists who have come and gone in recent years. 1 John 2, 18-19 Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. 
For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. John briefly identifies what he means by the term Antichrist, which only appears in his letters. But the concept of Antichrist is interwoven throughout the scripture, in the prophets, the gospels, and of course in John's revelation. John acknowledges that there will be one day be an ultimate Antichrist that will arise and rule for a short time. In the meantime, there are those who are examples of an Antichrist in that they are people who seek to supplant Yeshua or falsely represent him. We had seen several examples of Antichrist in the form of false messiahs in our studies of the Book of Acts over the last several months, but none were the Antichrist. It's important to note that in verse 19 that John clearly identifies these were Antichrists or where these Antichrists come from. They come from the body of believers. If you wish to explore this concept of the Antichrist further, Brenda and I have a four-part teaching on the biblical identity of the Antichrist available in our video archives on YouTube and Facebook. Now John says that the true believer has a protection that will guide him and keep him focused on the truth. Look at 1 John 2, 20-23. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Because of the rise of Gnosticism at the end of the first century, many false teachers rose up and claimed to have a special knowledge or anointing from God, and that they alone could teach the people about God and His ways. In verse 21, John is telling the believers that he uh, wasn't writing to them because they didn't know the truth, but because that they did know it that the believers were the ones with the special anointing of God, which is the Holy Spirit. Now, John MacArthur in his commentary on 1 John writes, The apostle, or John, wrote as he did because his readers already knew the gospel and its attendant truths and would understand his appeal to the exclusivity of biblical truth. John ends his admonishment of the believers by reminding them that they do know the truth, that they need to stick with that which they have known from the beginning. They are not to be deceived by the spirit of Antichrist in their midst. 1 John 2, 24-27 Therefore, let that abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. The believers throughout Asia Minor at the end of the first century faced persecution of a nature that we can only imagine. We see in the time of John how the ways of the world creep slowly and relentlessly into the doctrines of the assembly of believers. John's letter was a guide to them at that time, and as we see many of the same philosophies and doctrines in the world around us today, we can take the words of John to heart and guard against the spirit of Antichrist slowly creeping into the body of believers today. We too can stay steadfast and focused on the things which we have known from the beginning. I'm Dan Cathcart from Moed Ministries International. Shalom and be blessed.